So we're almost halfway through 2020, and so far this hasn't been the best year. And there's been maybe a couple funny and maybe comedic ways that uh, some people have communicated that truth to us. One of my favorites that I saw this last week was a social media post someone shared with me where there's this picture of a scientist looking into a cave, and the title says, Scientist Discovers 33 Creatures in a Cave That Had Been Sealed Up for Millions of Years. And then below in the comments section, there's this highlight around one of the comments which says, Dude, seal that cave up and walk away. 2020 is not the year to open that up. <laughs> Another funny one in honor of the 35th anniversary of Back to the Future is Doc talking to Marty McFly and saying, no matter what you do, do not set it to 2020. And my personal fave, especially with uh, SpaceX, the exploration that began last week were some of the jokes, and there's been several of them, about Elon Musk being brilliant, but even more so those people that went into space because they just decided, we're out of here. We're like, we're just going to leave. <laughs> and as with all jokes, what makes them so funny is that there's kind of some truth to it. This hasn't really been the best year. And I don't even have to give you all of the reasons just because even the past few weeks have said a lot. Then you go back even before that to the last couple months. This hasn't been the best year. And when it comes to the, these types of experiences and the domino effect of the worse getting even worse yet still, we kind of have this tendency in us to, to kind of just want to escape. And although I don't think any of us are the next candidates to hop on a spaceship, and the DeLorean doesn't actually enable us to go back to the past or to skip ahead into the future, we still try to escape in some ways. Whether we're trying to escape psychologically by using, whether we kind of hop behind the perceived security of screens, or whether we try to shut ourselves out or the world out from us. And when we do that, what good are we to ourselves? What good are we to the world that the Lord has called us to serve? And to add to it, then you kind of get ready to shake your heads and, and to kind of throw your hands up in fear and dismay and wonder, like, even if I were to try and do something to be of benefit to the world that the Lord has put, the world that, that the Lord has put us in, that we would serve, at best, it'll, it'll be so small. And at worst, it'll just be squashed or squelched. So what gives? Like, what good, what benefit can we actually do, even if we are moved to try and do something to better the brokenness of the world that we so easily see around us? But what if I told you today that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has given you exactly what you need, not just as you look out and perceive the world, but has given you exactly what you need so that you would be of benefit to the world. What is more, even just on the micro level, as you view yourself and you might be tempted to throw up your hands and shake your head in helplessness and hopelessness, that the triune God from all eternity gives you everything that you need for you. Once again, my friends, we're going to see, as we've been seeing throughout this series, that we are better together. God has not designed us. He did not design the world to be full of individuals who are marching to the beat of their own drum. We kind of see how that goes, in, even in our society today. But especially as a church that is called together and to be woven, not just as an individual strand, but strands that are part of the fabric that is the church, God would be of great benefit to us to bring us the unity that only He could give, the unity that he is, and that he would also use us to give that to the world. I invite you to have that gospel lesson open that I just read before from Matthew chapter 28. And I encourage you to ask the question. You've asked it in one form or another. How could we go? Why bother? Why go? Well, there's two answers that God's going to give us. Because of who God is and also because of what God gives. So the context you can see right away in the first couple verses. The disciples go to Galilee to see Jesus just at the place where he had told them. This is the last time he's going to be with them physically before he's ascended into heaven. And you might imagine, just as the disciples would, okay, these are the same disciples who ditched Jesus when he was captured. These are the disciples who deserted him when he needed them the most. These are the disciples who were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews that they were going to be crucified next until Jesus finally appeared to them that Easter Sunday, and then Thomas the next Sunday after that. 
So these are those disciples. So now Jesus is going to leave them again. How is this going to go? Do you think that they were going to pause a little bit and kind of wonder, well, now what? Actually, if you read the Acts chapter 1 account, there's this really intuitive thing that the angel says. After Jesus ascends into heaven, the angel says, why are you standing here? Uh Uh-oh, here's those disciples again. Do you think that after Jesus left and things were going to be difficult for them, persecution was going to be turned up, all of the apostles, as far as we know from history, were martyred except for one, this wasn't going to get easier, do you think that they were going to be tempted to look out into the world and say, why bother? Why go? This isn't even 2020 yet. I hope at first you see that that you and I should not be so intoxicated by the perceived novelty of our day. And it is into that reality that the disciples would soon experience that Jesus says what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is going to make sure that nobody makes the mistake of misunderstanding who he is. He positions himself in the the ordering of words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right in between. But there's no ordering of power. There's no displacement of position. He is one of the persons of the Trinity, equal in power and glory and might, united with with the others as one Godhead in a way that we cannot comprehend. The infinite can't fit into finite brains. But make no mistake, even though we can't understand it, so too we cannot comprehend how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been in control despite the way that things may seem. It's no wonder that Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. One God, always in control, despite what we see. Hasn't it always been this way? I mean, as you you look at the beginning of the world, even though you and I were not there to see it, all things were made through him in the beginning. The one who existed from before there was ever a beginning. Even though you and I were never there to hear it, throughout all of the ages, he was and is the point of every promise and prophecy that would come to pass in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And now at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, just take a survey of the Gospel of Matthew throughout these 28 chapters. Even though he does not look like royalty, the Prince of Peace was born of a virgin. Even though it did not look like a throne, the King of Heaven was laid to rest in a manger in Bethlehem. Even though it looked as though there was no control and his life was about to be lost at the hands of a wicked and cruel puppet king by the name of Herod, the king of kings was seeing to it that his plan was going just as he had planned it from the get-go. Even though people thought that these wise men traveling from afar and being led by a star would would go to some royalty, would go to some throne room, would go to some palace. The last thing they would go to is to some house in Bethlehem. Remember where they went. They went to the feet of that boy Jesus and laid their gifts, and they were led by a star, whom, which that boy Jesus controls, just as he does with every other, despite the way things seem. Even though he was taking a nap, and it seemed like all was lost in the Sea of Galilee, he opened up his eyes, and the king of all creation opened up his mouth, and the wind and the waves heard the voice of their maker, and they listened. Even though it seemed like he was being captured and contained, God's plan was unfurling. Even though it seemed as though all was lost as he was nailed to a cross, breathed his last, and was buried God's plan, which cannot be contained or categorized, was coming to its culmination, especially as Jesus rose from the dead and walked out of that tomb. As you and I stand on our own virtual, perceived mountaintop and look at the world around us and get ready to wring our hands, raise them, shake them, shake our heads, as this world is always never in anyone's control, certainly not in ours. It seems like it is swirling down to the bottom of a toilet and Satan's got his hand on the flusher. The question you and I might be tempted to ask is, why why bother? 
what are we going to do? Woe is us. When the real question we should be asking is, what is new? What is new? I mean, remember the last time that sp- space was a really big subject matter? And it was a few decades ago when space was a really big matter, when we were in the space race, and, and racism was also a really big matter, and politics were also a really big matter. And I've never heard anyone refer to the 60s as the golden years. Is, is, is our age really all that new? Or when you think of something that was much worse than the coronavirus, like something like the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages. Or or you think of even what these disciples would face. Should any of us ever walk around wondering, man, this world is just spinning out of control, and what are we going to do about it? Why even bother? Why go? And all the while, and in the, the face of all of that, the one who contains and controls all things in perfect unity with the Father and the Spirit says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Make no mistake where all control lies. Despite, despite what we think, despite how we doubt, and despite the way that things seem. But the beautiful part about the one who is speaking this is when you consider who is speaking it. The one who is the Savior, your Savior and mine, the one who has perfect unity, does not just want to enjoy this unity with the Father and the Spirit. He does not, he is not content to just have and experience unity and peace with the Father and the Spirit. The one who came to accomplish everything for our salvation says that all authority belongs to him so that he would leverage all of that authority and power for the good of reaching and saving a world that was lost. Don't you see? Just the beauty in the one who is speaking these words. He is your Savior who possesses all authority and power. Therefore, he's not content to have this unity to himself, but to see to it that he would use all of his power to bring you into it so you would experience what this world could never give you and also what this world can never take away. Unity with the Father who has loved you from before the creation of the world. Unity with the Son who loved you and took your sin and your shame and your doubts and your, your failure to, to put off perceptions and to trust in faith all on himself and paid, paid the payment and his sacrifice and rose to prove it. Unity with the Spirit who this very moment and by the power of the word that he uses works in your heart to strengthen you so you would enjoy unity that you can't see or find in this world. He is this kind of God. Not just somebody who experiences unity for the benefit of himself, but unity that he would use throughout his work so you would experience it with him now and forever. This is who God is. Why go? How can we not? How can you not when you think of the kind of God that you have who has called you to be united with him and with one another in this way? Why go? Because of what God gives These very next words, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore, go. So you you have to go. Why? Because God says so. But there's more than that. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go because of this great purpose that God has given to you. Your life isn't meaningless. It is filled with purpose and intention. That God could control all things and send angels to bring others into this unity that we so enjoy with God. That God so enjoys as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he hasn't. Something that the angels even envy, Scripture tells us. How God's plan is unfurling and and the carrying out of his mission through his church. He has given that to you. And even think of it this way. How many people throughout the ages have heard this And because God has changed their hearts, they were the ones that went. Pastors and missionaries, teachers and parents, other ancestors, even neighbors, they heard this. Go! And they didn't pause. Maybe they did, but after a while they went and God used them. And generation after generation, what ended up happening to you in your time, in your life? The ones who who heard Jesus' words on the mountain were not the last. And who reaps the reward today? How loved by God are we that God would see to it to send people 
to reach us. And since he loves us so, how can we, how can we not go? And when you also consider what God is doing when he looks at the world, God, of all people, really could look at the world and shake his head and just flick earth into oblivion and be done with it. But God looks at the world and what does he have beating in the cavernous corners of his heart is, is divine, imponderable love. And so God would send his son from heaven to earth for us, not because of there's, there's some intrinsic value in us, not because he thought, you know what, you might have some potential, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gamble on this one, but all right. No, but simply because of his grace. And since you and I, undeserving, lost as we were, have now been called into the family of God, how can we not go, especially when it comes to all nations? You know this, it doesn't matter if they're young or old. It doesn't matter if there's dreadlocks, mo mohawks, or no locks because they're bald. It doesn't matter if they're black or yellow or red or white or pasty white or polka dotted. And you know this. But, but you also know why. Because the God of heaven, if there was ever a supreme race or class, the God of heaven left heaven for us. So all nations, that's us. It doesn't matter. And you might not be able to go to Europe or Australia to Africa or to South America. But guess what? Is your neighbor part of all nations? And who is your neighbor? Not just the person within a stone's throw. Is that relative who's straying and lost spiritually, is, are they part of all nations? That loved one? A child? A parent? Are they part of all nations? That family down the street that looks at things and approaches things differently, are they part of all nations? That person who you think they're such a cultural barrier, they'll never listen to me. Are they part of all nations? Then they're on the board. And God has positioned you to reach them because he says, go, making disciples of all nations. And you're going to think, how am I going to do that? I don't have the right words to say. I fumble. I don't know as much as my pastor does. Odds are you do. You know more than me. Um, I, I can't speak. The, oh, all these reasons. And, and at the end of the day, what does God give you? He gives you the two things that you need. Tools, in fact. He gives the power of his word. Making disciples because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are powerfully at work. He doesn't use you because you have the power. He says he gives you the power of his word. And by that, you have everything that you need to make disciples through the power of baptism as God puts his name on believers that he makes. He puts his name on people that were lost and makes them part of his family by the power of his word. You have everything that you need. In a world that is lost in racism and division, dissension and fear, lying as people listen to whatever they like to hear, even if it's not based in truth or reality or benefit to their neighbor. You have everything that this world needs because you have all of the authority of God and all of his, thing, his teachings that he has commanded you to share. That is meaning. That is truth. It is based in fact because the risen and ascended Lord has given it to you. You have everything that this world needs in the power of God's word. In a world that loves sound bites and headlines. In a world that is falling prey to clickbait. In a world that loves to listen to what, whatever the latest trends are, regardless of whether or not they're going to benefit us or our neighbor, you have something much more valuable to share. It is the mission that God has given to the church to make disciples step by step, to reach and encourage, to have conversations with, to be present to listen, to encourage, to share the word, to be there days that are good and days that are difficult, to not just fall prey into the thought that just because you post something, therefore everyone's going to listen, to not fall prey to any of that, but to, to see your number one mission as making disciples and reaching a soul with the power of God's word so that at the end of the day, they would also bear the name of the triune God because that is what God gives to that person in the power of baptism. You have everything that you need. Why go? Because of who God is. Why go? Because of all that God has given to you. And as if there's not enough that he's covered this far, he gives you one last thing. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When you're distressed because of what you're seeing on the news, when you're afraid of what the future might hold, when you're worried about what's coming of some of our cities and even our local community, 
when you're concerned about a virus, dissension and division, state of affairs of our government, our country in the years to come, what it's going to look like for our children, and all you can think of is, oh, what's wrong with this world? You have a God who is with you with not just every step that you take, but every breath that you make. The God who breathed life into you, who formed you in the womb of your mother, who called you to be part of his family by putting the name of the triune God, his name on you and claiming you as his own. This is the same God who says, I am with you always. I'm with you. Emmanuel, with you to the very end of the age. Why go? How can we not? God grant it. Amen. Amen.